Thank you for listening to Crossroads Community Church of Jefferson Hills. At Crossroads, our mission is to be the church by sharing and showing the love of Christ and inviting others to be recipients of Christ's love. Now here's this week's message from Pastor Floyd Hughes. All right, good morning, Crossroads. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship celebration where we love celebrating Jesus, uh, especially during trying times when there's escalations of violence in and around our nation. Um, So uh, I wanted to start this morning and just take a moment and pray for our nation. Uh, So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. God, we lift up our nation to you as a whole. And in light of the violence yesterday, we pray that it would not be used to further divide our nation, but through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would use it to draw our nation closer together, to unify not only your people, but all people in our nation. And we pray that whether, uh, regardless of political party, regardless of nationality, regardless of uh, one's political outlook, that we would be a people that denounces violence and seeks unity amongst our nation. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we continue with our Sunday celebration. Actually, not a couple, just one. We're continuing to uh, help purchase and fill backpacks. And I know, no one's thinking about back to school, especially kids right now. But it's going to come sooner than you think. So uh, we are taking up donations. Our goal is to, how many did I say, 20. We want to fill 20 backpacks that are going to be given away uh, at an event held at First Presbyterian Church in Elizabeth uh, to families and children in need. And I think, if I remember correctly, last year they did 200 backpacks. And this year the goal is to do 300 backpacks. And even if nobody wants to contribute. We as a congregation said we're going to donate to fill at least 20, because that's the average price of a classroom uh, anyway. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, just grab one of the envelopes at the back, write backpack, put $8 in it, uh, and you'll be helping out a lot of children in need. Uh, This morning, we're continuing a series we did walking through the book of Judges. uh, And I don't know how many recall, but there were multiple judges that God called uh, to first deliver his people and then to lead his people. Uh, Now, here's the thing. I want to show you this quickly before we go back to the list of judges because there was a cycle of sin that we talked about where people would be in this period of disobeying God. They'd cry out to God. Uh, God would raise up a judge, and then the people of Israel would stay faithful as long as they had the God-honoring leaders over them which is something that we, uh, if we're Christians, if we're God-honoring people, that's something that we should be praying for, that we have God-honoring leaders over us, regardless of our political affiliation, regardless of what nation we're in. If we're Christians, we should want God-honoring leaders over us. So God raises up, as we're about to see uh, in Judges chapter 6, he raises up Gideon, who is the fifth judge that he raises up. Now, even though it's only the fifth judge, this is a couple of generations. This is a little bit uh, about 200 years since Joshua passed away. And that's when they began this cycle of of disobeying God and sin and all of that stuff. So if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Judges chapter 6. But while you do, I want to share something with you. While you turn to Judges chapter 6, and if there's not a Bible on your table or under your chair, let me know, we'll have someone bring to you. Because we're about to see something that's pretty unique and that you don't see often throughout the Bible, especially with a lot of the judges. We're going to get a chance to look at the interaction where God shows up and calls Gideon to be a judge. Now, here's the thing. Most of the time, when God shows up to someone, um, and when I say most of the time, uh, It means I didn't count, but a lot of the time, when God shows up to someone, uh, there's usually a good reason or it's a bad reason. Uh, And most people say, oh, it's a bad reason 
but sometimes there's a good reason. So when you look through the Bible, God shows up and he tells people, hey, go do something because I want to do something for the people of God, for the nation, for a community through you. So God will show up and he will tell people, hey, I want to do something through you, which is a good thing, right? But here's the problem. A lot of people get scared. A lot of people get nervous because you would think, oh, if God wants me to do this, I have to be what? Perfect, right? Nowhere in the Bible does God call a perfect person that's human, one of us, to do his will. He calls people who are broken. He calls people who are hurting. He calls some people who are on the verge of suicide and depressed. He calls people that are sinful. But when he calls them, he says, hey, I want you to be in obedience because I want to do something through you that's going to change your life and it's going to change the lives of your community. But sometimes when God shows up, it is because people didn't do what he told them to do. And he shows up to say, hey, I called you to do this. Why didn't you do the thing that I told you to do? And we looked at in Judges where he shows up to the people of Israel and says, why didn't you do the thing that I told you to do? Because they're all like, why do we keep getting you know, overtaken by these other nations? Why do we keep getting, having to deal with uh, this oppressiveness from other nations? And God shows up and says, why didn't you do what I told you to do, because that's the reason you're going through this cycle of sin. And sometimes he shows up and he just says, hey, why didn't you do the thing that I told you to do the way I told you to do it, right? Because there was uh, uh, Samuel who he told, hey, go destroy this nation. Don't leave anything. Don't take anything. They took sheep. They took money. They took whatever. He told Moses, speak to the rock. Speak to the people. Moses decided to do it his way, and God showed up and says, why didn't you do the thing that I told you to do the way that I told you to do it? Because that's going to be a crucial part of what we're going to see uh, what happens. So uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Judges chapter 6. And if you're using one of the Bibles on the table or in front of you, uh, it's page 174. Uh, and we're going to start in verse 11 because we read through verses 1 through 10 last week. So in verse 11, this is what it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? We are all as wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. And I want to put this in perspective because you can hear people say that today. Where is God when we look at people that can't pay their bills? Where is God when we look at people that are struggling financially? Where is God when we see people getting sick and, and, and we see the kind of violence that we see happening in our city streets? And where is God through all this? But when they asked, and Gideon asked, where is God? If you go back, uh, and you can stay there, in Judges chapter 5 is what it says. So may all your enemies perish, Lord. But may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. Then the land had peace for 40 years. This is a song that Deborah and Barak sang after they delivered Israel from the hands of an oppressive nation. And the land had peace for 40 years. That's where God was with the people that were obeying him under a godly leader because Deborah was judging or leading or governing, whatever word you want to use, the nation of Israel at that time. But the next verse, chapter 6, verse 1, said, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. And that word evil that we looked at before, it means to do evil, uh, not just to be unkind, but to be wicked and vicious, vicious and to do violence. This is the way they began treating one another when they let the influence of the culture permeate the people of God. And this is what happens when they allow the culture to influence them instead of them having a godly influence on the culture because the culture they were in was very violent. It was, excuse me, very promiscuous. It was very, it doesn't matter how you treat other people as long as you're living your best life. And they began to do that 
And so God allowed the Midianites to come in and oppress them. Uh, drop down to verse 14. So the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And I just, I just want to mention this for a minute, because this is something that is throughout not only the book of Judges, but throughout the Bible, and that is God will use anyone who is willing. Anyone who wants to be used by God, any person who says, okay, God, you know what? I'm not perfect. I'm not great. I don't have all the answers, but God will use anyone who is willing. Drop down to verse 22. And in verse 22, it says this. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And really quick, the word angel means messenger. We use the word angel to mean angelic being. They use the word angel to mean messenger. So Gideon thought he was talking to a messenger of the Lord. Then he realized he was talking to Lord Jehovah God. And he said, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. And to this day, it stands in Ophrah, of the Abizarites, and that, that word means Jehovah Shalom. So that same night, this is important, verse 25, that same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bow from your father's herd, one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, Offer the second bowl as a burnt offering. This is what had happened in what was supposed to be a culture that worshipped God and treated people with God's morality and God's justice. They built an altar to Baal, which said, do whatever you want, which they would sacrifice their children to this God. And they built an Asherah pole, which, let me look around the room real quick. Okay, we're all of age. Was in the form of a male body part. I'll just leave it at that. And they would worship at that. And God told uh, Gideon, he said, hey, the first thing that you need to do is you need to tear that down. So Gideon took 10 of his servants, verse 27, and did as the Lord told him, because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town. He did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. And they asked, who did this? And when they investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. Now, here's the thing. God knew that the first step that the people needed to take in order to get back to him was to separate themselves from the culture, right? God knew that, hey, if you're going to take this step in returning back to the people of God, that you have to return uh, to the, by separating yourself from the culture and by separating yourselves from the cultural idols that you have begun to worship. And the same is true today. Because we look, and even now, and especially not to bring light on what happened yesterday, but amongst Christians who love God and worship God, they're divided politically. And many of them have put politicians and their Democratic Party up on a pedestal. Many have put their denomination up on a pedestal. Many have put uh, working and earning money up on a pedestal. And we put a lot of cultural things up on a pedestal, and they had to break down the idols, but what God calls us to do today is to repent, which literally means to turn away from that thing that we're worshiping instead of God, and that's the first step in turning back to God. And here's the reality. Some of us may be afraid to do it because if we turn away from it, we might get canceled like many people are today. If we stand up and say to other people that, hey, what you're saying about what happened last night isn't right, that they're going to get mad at us, they're going to delete us as their Facebook friend. If we stand up and say, hey, I don't care about political parties, trying to take the life of another person is wrong according to the will of God, and then you're afraid that they might say stuff about you, 
But this is what God calls us to do. If we claim to be the people of God, then we have to stand up for what's right, not for a party, not for a culture, not even for a nation, but for God, right? Drop down to verse 36. Gideon said, and this is, this is, this is awesome. Gideon said, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. Now this, I want to I show you this. This is not an actual wool fleece because... You know, I'm a small church pastor, so a real fleece is out of my price range. But what he did was he took a fleece and he laid it down on the threshing floor where they would thresh wheat and it was outdoors and where people could see. And he said this, and, and, and he said, hey, God, if, if this is you calling me to go do this, calling me to stand up, calling me to stand up to my family, calling me to stand up to the nation, calling me to rally people to do the right thing for you, I want to make sure this is you. And it's not just me thinking I'm all that. So if this is you, I want you to make the, the, the fleece filled with dew, but everywhere around it, I want it to be like bone dry. And when he got up the next morning, uh, it says he wrung out a bowl full of water out of the fleece, but all around it was dry. And when it says bowl, not like what we in a Rice Krispie bowl, it was a big bowl that they would use to carry like uh, grain and, and that type of stuff. And so it was a significant size, like, bowl, right? And then he, 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 he took it a step further and said, okay, God, uh, give, me, give, me, give me one more opportunity. And he laid it out again. And he said, this time, instead of making the fleece wet, if this is really you, I need you to do something that only God would do. So I know it's you for sure. So I want you to make the fleece dry, bone dry, but do everywhere around it be wet. And he woke up the next morning and it was wet. And people ask all the time, is that something that we should do as Christians? Should we doubt God? Should we ask God? Should we be like, God, prove to me this is you? And I've heard people say, I'm not sure. You should trust God and just go do it. You may disagree with me, but I think wholeheartedly. If you're trying to accomplish a God-sized task, you better make sure that God is the one who sent you. Because otherwise, you're out here doing this God-sized task in your own strength. And it's not going to work. And we have seen, whether it's, whether it's people who start churches, whether it's people who start ministries, whether it's people who start jobs, whether it's people who start relationships, God called me to do this thing, and God's sitting there like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That wasn't me. I didn't call you to that. And we see them excited about it, and we see it rise, and we see them fail, and there have been pastors, and there have been, and I've seen online, especially recently, people after people, oh, well, the church today is not working, so I'm going to start a church, because God has called me to it, and there's a God-honoring church on that block, a God-honoring church on that block, a God-honoring church on that block, and I'm like, I don't think that was God. That might have been just you. Now, granted, there are a lot of communities with a church on that block, a church on that block, a church on that block, and they ain't the church. So someone needs to go in there. But that's why you need to make sure that it's God calling you to it and that it's the thing that God wants you to do. All right, uh, drop down to chapter 7, verse 1. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod, the camp of Midian, the camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Murrah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands in order that Israel may not boast against me, that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. Drop down to verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men, that lapped, I will save you. Underline that. Underline that. God said, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other men go each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. And this is why it's important to ensure God is calling you to the task. Because if God calls you to it, it is so that God can do it. Not so that you can say, look what I did, but so that God can say, look what he did. Drop down to verse 19. So he spread out the, the 300 men. And in verse 19, Gideon and 100 men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. 
just as they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and uh, smashed the jars and grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon while each man held his position around the camp. All the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men, underline that, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords and they fled. And here's the important thing. Everyone tries to understand, like, what was the supernatural, spiritual thing that happened with these uh, uh, lanterns? And they had uh, lanterns that they put uh, a fire in. And I've heard people say, even though they were spaced out, the way that it worked is there was no air in it. So when they broke it, it created a ring of fire. And that's what caused the men to go into disarray. And I kind of understand that, but no. God literally said what caused the men to go into disarray. He caused it. He did it. And this is the problem that we have, because when someone is successful at something, uh, we tend to try to take credit for it or explain it. But if God calls us to something and it works, it's because God did it. It's not because we did it. It's not because there's some scientific explanation to why the candles that were inside of the, uh, the jars and when they broke and what happened and a wind blew or whatever. No, there's no scientific explanation for it. The explanation is what God said. He caused the people to go into disarray. The victory belonged to God. And I'm going to show you why that's so important that we understand it. Because in chapter 8, is what it says. The Israelites, after the victory over these people, the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Gideon. And sadly, this is usually the response from God's people when someone does something successful, right? But Gideon responded properly, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. But when something successful happens, and like when people plant a church and it starts to grow, they're like, hey, I'm going to follow this pastor because this pastor is doing the right thing. Or when there's a governmental leader, whether it be Trump, whether it be Biden, when they're doing something, people say, I'm going to follow this man. If we're the people of God, we're not to follow a man. We are supposed to follow after God. He is the one who we're supposed to give the praise to. He is the one who we're supposed to give the glory to. He is the one that we are supposed to follow. Because here's the reality. Think about this. If we start following a man and say, hey, that person, that man, he's responsible for the success, what happened when that man screws up? Our hope dies. What happened when that man, because he is a man, dies? Then hope dies. But when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus, he is never ending. He will always be with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. And even when men fail and nations fall and all of these businesses uh, do crazy things, we still have a God who is consistent and just and moral that we can put our faith in. So let me summarize with this really quick. Because we started this, when we started this series, we said we want to look at what are some steps that we, as the people of God, Christians in America, we can take to turning back to God as a people, to coming united to God as a people. And if we look at everything that happened in this passage, we can see one thing we definitely need to do is invite the people of God to do the work of God. Because there's a lot of people like Gideon that God's like, I want to use you. But like Gideon, they're hiding because they're afraid. They don't want to be associated with the church. Uh, some, I talk to people all the time who are like, I used to go to church, but I left because someone was mean to me. I left because someone said something bad to me. Some people left for legitimate reasons because they were in churches that never should have been called a church. And they were mistreated because of what they wore or the color of their skin or because they didn't earn enough money or because they earned too much and so people judged them. But those are legitimate people who, like Gideon, are sitting there asking, where is God now? And we're the ones who God is calling to go to them and say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry for what you went through, but I really would love for you to come 
and to join me at my congregation because I feel like God can really use you. And again, I've said this before a hundred times over, it's not about filling the seats or filling the pews. It's about bringing people back into relationship with God. And the first step is we've got to invite them to do so. And I don't want any person to raise their hand. Don't raise your hand. But think about the last time that you invited someone to a Sunday celebration. For many of us, it was months ago, or reality, years ago. Even though we know that there are people in our circles of influence who, man, they could really use God in their life right now, right? So that's the first step. Uh, the second thing is um, to do this is to equip the people of God to discern the call of God. Because there are so many people who are like, God called me to do this, and we all know God did not call you to do that. We all know God did not call you uh, to be a pastor. I, let me say this in a way that doesn't call anyone out. But I feel like it's, it, it needs to be said because I've seen several people that like just recently in the last few months, God is really calling me to plant a church in my neighborhood. And again, there's churches all around that neighborhood. And a part of me wants to say, dude, you don't even know the books of the Bible. How are you going to equip people to know God when you don't spend that much time with him yourself? And I'm not saying you have to have a degree or be perfect, but if you're trying to plant a church then you're trying to bring the people of God together and you want to share the word of God with them, which means you might want to open it up and read it. And the first thing, we need to equip people to discern the call of God. And it's really easy because I get people all the time, how do I know God has called me to that? It's really easy. Uh, pray, seek godly counsel, and is what you're being called to do confirmed in the word of God? Pray, pray, pray. If you want to lay out, if it were me, lay down multiple fleeces. God, if this is what, before we moved here, granted, we've been here 17 years, but before we moved here, God, if this is really you, I'm going to need some real confirmation that this is what you're calling me to do, to leave, you know, current job, we're making lots of money and happy, uh, current friends and family, current church family, to move to a place where I don't know a soul and I laid down a bunch of fleeces, probably more than necessary, because I wanted to be beyond a shadow of a doubt, make sure it was God. But then I also sought godly counsel. Because there are some people that will tell you, there are some people will tell you, yeah, that sounds great, go do it. But there are some people that will pull you aside and say, hey, you know what? I just got to be honest with you. I don't think this is what God is calling you to do. This isn't you. This isn't who you are. And if God's going to call you to do it, uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe take some time and pray some more because this just doesn't sound like something God is calling you to do, right? And, and seek biblical confirmation. Does the thing that God's calling you to do, does it line up with the word of God, right? Uh, so here's the last thing. Steps to turning back to God if you give praise to and follow God and not man. I mean, that's, that's as simple as it gets. When things go right, give praise to God. When things are working, give praise to God. When things are not going right, don't blame God, but definitely seek the face of God. But we live in a culture where everyone is looking for someone to follow. If it's not a politician, then it's an actor. If it's not an actor, then it's, it's, it's whoever. And if it's not someone uh, famous, then we'll look for people in our communities. Oh, you know, Larry, Larry's here. We talk about him when he's not here. Now he's here. We can talk about him too. Uh, oh, Larry, he does great things in our community. Everyone should follow Larry. Let's lift up and do whatever Larry says. But we all know Larry's not perfect because Larry's human. And hopefully if Larry is doing some great stuff, Larry's going to say, hey, don't follow me. Follow after God. Because anything I've done, I've done in the strength of God. I'm going to ask the band to come up, and we're going to spend a moment praying uh, before we sing this song again. And even though this is an old song, I feel like it's, 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 it's a song that should never go away because it's the epitome of what we're just reading about, that the hope for us as a people, for us as individuals, for us as a church, for us as a congregation, for the body of Christ in America does not rest on any one individual on this planet. It rests in Christ alone. So I'm going to ask you to stand. God, we thank you so much that everything that we as a nation are able to accomplish comes from you. 
We thank you so much that when our forefathers founded this nation, they did it in your strength. They didn't make it a nation where they forced people to worship you, but they made it a nation where they acknowledged everything that we have is because of you. And we pray that we would do so as well. We pray that we would acknowledge that our strength and our hope and our future as the people of God, as a nation, rests in Christ alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. God, both as a nation and as your people, I pray that we would stand and seek your strength and your unity and your will for this nation. I pray that your people would rise up and speak your truth boldly. I pray that we would rise up in every situation and respectfully, lovingly, gracefully, and boldly share and show the love of Christ to those in our circles of influence. I pray that we would reach out to those who say they're Christians but have wandered away from the church and we would invite them to be a part of your body. I pray that we would seek those people who are hurting and we would show them the justice and the morality of a loving God who sent his son to die for them. I pray that we who call ourselves by your name would live out your love and your grace and your justice in this world. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. We hope you enjoyed the message. If you did, please leave a comment on our webpage, crossroadsofjeffersonhills.com, or our Facebook page. You can also join our Sunday celebration every Sunday at 1037 a.m. We look forward to hearing from you online or in person. Thank you, and God bless.